now we have reached the particularly exciting part of the events as part of this conference, tonight's performance of extracts from the 1936 Toussaint Virtual play, the, the story of the only successful slave revolt in history. This reading of extracts will be the first performance since 1936 of precursor to CLR James's classic history of the Haitian Revolution, The Black Jacobins, which started life as a play with Paul Robeson in the lead. In 1936, there were only two performances of the play, and the first of which actually took place on a Sunday, like today, and um, the second of which was a matinee the next day. In addition to reading from the 1936 play, these actors are also going to perform an intriguing, never-before-published or performed epilogue to the second 1967 The Black Jacobins play. And tonight's performance will feature Taiwo Luko and also, I think, seven, seven friends. And I found out what the seven friends' names are. Errol Smith, Patrick Graham, Jennifer John, Jamie Brownson, Lee Ray, Lewis Joyce and Danelle Reynolds. Those of you here who are Liverpool-based will already know Tayo Aluko, um, but for those of you who don't, Tayo is a very well-respected Liverpool-based actor, originally from Nigeria, and he's best known for his award-winning one-man show, Call Mr. Robeson, based on the life of Paul Robeson. Um, and so Tayo is particularly well-suited to this role because Paul Robeson, famous African-American actor and civil rights activist, played Toussaint in 1936 in London, and also because the second play, so the Black Jacobins 1967, um, the Black Jacobins play, had its 1967 premiere in Nigeria during the Nigerian Civil War. So without further ado, um, I'm going to pass over to the crew. Thanks very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I've just met these four people for the first time about two hours ago. Uh, these two in particular answered a text message from these two. Uh, I had spoken to Errol uh, for the first time two days ago and met him here for the first time today. Uh, a rehearsed reading is a bit of an exaggeration because there hasn't been very much rehearsal because we have all been doing different things. But what we have quickly come up with is the necessity to tell you just one thing. It was set in San Domingo, blacks on one side, whites on the other. That's quite obvious. <laughs> but um, because of the numbers that we have, there will be occasions where a black person is playing a white character or vice versa a white character playing a black character. But even though I know you're extremely intelligent uh, people, we have decided that at that point, there will be a red light on the person who is changing color. <laughs> uh, and I think, I think that is all you need to know. Um, clearly, we're not gonna do uh, all the scenes from the play. Some of them are inserts from unpublished extracts, um, including the epilogue. I think we shall just start with some sound. August 6th, 1791. The depths of a forest. A little clearing is dotted with groups of Negro slaves. Bookman, played by Dessaline, Jean, Jean, Jean Francois. As the curtain rises, Bookman is addressing the crowd. All through the scene, there is the steady beat of drums. Liberty, equality, fraternity. The white slaves in France, they suffered like us. They've made a revolution. They killed the slave owners, made everybody free. They've divided the property, and now in France they have liberty, equality, and fraternity. Yay. Brothers, we suffer. I know how we suffer. 
All is ready and we are not afraid to fight. But before we kill, let us make a petition and go one day to the Colonial Assembly. We'll tell them... No petition. We have to fight. Yeah, no. no tomorrow. Now. Yeah. No more work. No more whips. Black man eats bananas. Black man eats potatoes. White man eats bread. If white man wants bread, let white man work. If we kill the whites, we are free. I, Desolé, will work no more. Liberty. 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 In the silence sounds clearly the quickened rhythm of the drum. And suddenly, Jeannot forces his way through the crowd and onto the platform. Today, a white man, old man with a white beard, came with petition to the master. He asked for rights. For who? For slaves? For slaves? No. For mulattoes. And what happened? Master hanged him on a tree in the garden. His slave ran. Master say, find him tomorrow or someone dig his own grave. Mm. With honey and molasses. Mm. And without stone throwing. A white man? See what they do to their own people? We must fight! Their hour has come. The God who created the sun, which gives us light, who rouses the waves and rules the storm, though hidden in the clouds, he watches us. He sees all that the white man does. The God of the white man inspires him with pride, but our God, who is good to us, orders us to revenge our wrongs. He will direct our arms and aid us. Throw away the symbol of God of the white, who have so often caused us to weep, and listen to the voice of liberty, which speaks to us through our hearts. He rips off a cross which hangs on a chain round his neck, and many Negroes do the same. A Negro emerges from the darkness behind the platform. He carries a vessel which he hands to Bookman. Bookman receives it carefully and raises it high. The Negroes drop to their knees. There is a great rattle of the drums. Again, Bookman raises his hand. Again, they crouch, looking up at him in silence. Bookman hands the vessel round to those on the platform to drink. Jeannot drinks deeply, dipping both hands in. As he raises his face, it is covered with blood which splashes down his dirty white shirt, the only garment he wears. Bookman turns to Toussaint and offers him the vessel. Toussaint hesitates. Drink, Toussaint. Drink, Toussaint. The kneeling Negroes call him to drink. Liberty! He takes, he takes a vessel into his hands and drinks. Liberty, Liberty or, or death. death? Liberty or death? Or death? Liberty, Liberty or, or death. death? The slaves melt away in different directions. Toussaint remains on the steps alone, his head bent. All go off except Desaline and Toussaint. Come, Toussaint. The slaves' encampment at the Grande Riviere. April, 1793. To some, would that grave be ready for tomorrow? I'm going to mass with General McCoy in the carriage and I want the six grey horses. I shall work on her tonight, Admiral. And to some, when you form your company, you'll be under the command of Bookman. Yes, Admiral. He's a drunken scoundrel and thinks only of women on his belly. Form your own company and then together we can surprise him. I'll make you Vice in his place. Thank you, Admiral. I shall remember that. Exit, Jean-Francois. Oh, God. These are the men on whom the fate of the black race depends. What future is there for us? He opens his book again. He reads, scarcely looking at the page, so often has he read the passage. A courageous chief only is wanted. Where is he? that great man whom nature owes to her vexed, oppressed, and tormented children. Where is he? He will appear, doubt it not. He will come forth and raise the sacred standards of liberty. This venerable signal will gather around him the companions of his misfortune. More impetuous than the torrents, they will everywhere leave the indelible traces of their just resentment. Everywhere, people will bless the name of the hero who shall have re-established the rights of the human race. Everywhere will they raise trophies in his honor. 
white men see Negroes as slaves. If the Negro is to be free, he must free himself. We have the courage, we have endurance, we have numbers. Where is he, that great man whom nature owes to have vexed, oppressed, and tormented children? Thou hast shown me the light, O God. I shall be that leader. A room in the government building in Porte au Prince. Dessalines, Maitland, Edouville, Lier, Rouen. A trumpet sounds, and Rouen and Hedouville, startled, jump to their feet. What is that? That is Tucson. But that is impossible. Yet, yes, it's he. There he is at his tricks again. His letter said that he was leaving Desalines in front of Jack Mel and setting off himself against Rigaud. Now he will come with a flawless excuse. Enter Mars Plaisir. The Commander-in-Chief, General Toussaint Louveteau. Good evening, Mr. Commissioner Rum. Good evening, Mr. Commissioner Edouville, Brigadier General Maitland. Mr. Consul. Monsieur Commissioner Edouville, I have to announce that San Domingo is now under your undisturbed command. Jacques Mel is taken. Jacques Mel is taken? Jacques Mel is taken. <laughs> Pétion cut his way out and has escaped with a few troops. Rigaud's last stronghold is destroyed, and finishing him off is merely a matter of days. Experienced diplomats as they are, the news has them all confounded. Hearty congratulations on your success, Commander-in-Chief. You go from strength to strength. You and your army of blacks will soon be as famous in these parts as General Bonaparte and his army in Europe. Happy the commissioners who have such a general and such soldiers to fight their battles. The Republic owes you a great debt, Commander-in-Chief. The French government will be happy to know that once more you have served her so faithfully. Victory always attends your arms, Commander-in-Chief. No servant of France is more worthy of her gratitude. Some used to say that you couldn't take Jacquemille, General. Uh, but I always knew that Rigaud and Pétion were no match for you. We discussed that, General Mittland, didn't we? We did, Mr. Consul. I thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> It is not often that a general fresh from the field of battle can receive at the same time the congratulations of not only his own country, but of such great countries as England and America. We were just arranging the terms of my evacuation, General. Where is uh, General Maurepas? We did not think it necessary for General Maurepas to be here, Commander-in-Chief. I had discussed the terms with you on your last visit from the front. General Midland. When the truce was declared, it was with me and my officers that you arranged the preliminary terms of peace. True, Commander-in-Chief. When your absence, I thought that I would deal with the representatives of the French government, the civil authority. General Edouville. You are the Commander-in-Chief of the army, but I am the head of the civil administration. It is always the civil authority which signs terms of peace, and I had already discussed all details with you. This puts me in an awkward position, General gentlemen. Maitland, would your government consider a treaty signed with me valid? We would have to, inasmuch as you are in command of the army, which lies in front of us. Then I shall sign the treaty. But what about the commissioner? When the treaty is being signed, the commissioner will not be here. Will not be here? Of course I will be here. No treaty signed would be valid without my sanction. San Domingo is a department of France and has representatives in the Council of 500 in Paris. In a week's time, an election takes place. By the law of France, whoever is asked to serve is bound to do so. I have good reason to know that General Edouville would be, will be elected as one of the representatives. But that's impossible. I am the commissioner. I have not been nominated. I cannot be nominated. You can be nominated, and you will be, General Edouville. And you will be elected unopposed. Three days after, a boat will leave for France, and it will be necessary for you to hasten to your legislative duties. But this is an outrage. General Louverture, there is no trick you have not tried to undermine the Republican authority in this colony. General Laveau, Commissioner Santanax, Commissioner Raymond, you have maneuvered them all out of the island by one means or another. 
You claim to work only for the liberty of your people, but it is your ambition that drives you. Peace will soon be declared in Europe, and once the French government is undisturbed by war, it will make you pay for your crimes. Let the French government punish me for my crimes, so long as it rewards me for my services. You have received enough rewards. What more do you want? You are commander-in-chief of the French army. Has any Negro ever reached as far as you? You shall not have full command of this island. I go, but I appoint, commi uh, I appoint Commissioner Rome as my successor with full power until instructions arrive from Paris. You shall submit yourself to his authority in all matters. Commissioner Rome, you are now responsible to the government of France for the colony of San Domingo. Commissioner Rome is already responsible to the government of France for another colony. Monsieur Commissioner Rome, by the terms of the Treaty of Basel between France and Spain, the Spanish portion of the island was ceded to France. You were appointed commissioner and ordered to take immediate possession. You sent General Agé and General Chanlat to arrange for the formal transfer of authority, but at the same time, you wrote to Don Joaquim Garcia, the Spanish governor general, telling him to refuse to hand over the colony. I have a copy of your letter in my possession. I did it because I have grown to mistrust your intentions. Had you and your soldiers got possession of Spanish San Domingo, you would have been master of the whole island, and it would have been still more difficult to control you. That, Mr. Commissioner, you will explain to the French government. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Brigadier General Dessaline will supply you with two carriages and a safe escort to the village of Dondon, where you will remain until the French government recalls you to render an account of your administration. I do not think, gentlemen, that these arrangements about the treaty concern you any further. Unless, perhaps, Monsieur Commissioner Edouville would like to consult further with Monsieur Commissioner Rum under the escort of General Dessalines. Exit, Hedeville and Rum. The office of Governor Levetier. Orderly, Moise, Dessalines, Madame Boulet. You want to go. All whites want to go. I have to go to resume my own life. It has nothing to do with politics or race. Yes, sweetheart, I know that. But tell me, why do all the whites want to go? Poisson, I know all that you are doing. The whites feel safe as long as you are governor. But when you are gone, who will row? People believe it is either General Dessalines, the tiger, or Moise. Moise, they say has no use for white people. If General Moise is your successor, all the whites will leave. People are saying that he is your nephew and that you are preparing him to succeed you. So you believe that Moise is going to succeed me, that I am bound to him? Louise, my dear Louise, how often have I told you that in serious matters, do not listen to gossip. Moise will never be ruler of San Domingo. I am not bound to him. I am bound to nobody. Even now, as I am speaking to you, Moise is before a court-martial on trial for treason. Moise, for treason? Treason to you? By Toisson, even as a boy in the old days, he worshipped you. These are revolutionary times. Who you worship today, you are ready to kill tomorrow, and sometimes for very good reasons. You see, Louise, Come, come and sit over here as you used to. She sits. Thank you. The country is very unsettled. Many people are quite sure that when the war is over, the French will send an expedition to restore slavery. But they will not do that. We hope not. But today, 1802, France is not the same France which abolished slavery in 1794. General Bonaparte, uh, the first consul, does not answer my letters. The country does not know where it stands. Moise is leading a section of the population against me. He wants a declaration of independence like the United States. He wants independence, the severance of all connection with the French. There is a knock at the door, an orderly enters. Is it General Dessalines? Yes, General. And he has with him General Moise and a guard. Ask General Dessalines to bring in General Moise. Madame Boulet rises to leave. No, Louise, don't go, don't go. Moise knows you. 
General Moyes enters between two soldiers. They are Marat and Orléans. General Dessalines behind him. Dessalines stands behind Moyes as if Moyes is a prisoner, which he is. Moyes wears a black patch over one eye. Toussaint sa stands. What is the decision of the court martial, General? Guilty of all counts. Sentences of death. I have sentence here. It only awaits your signature, General. Give it to me. Dessalines hands it over. Toussaint reads and turns to De General Moyes. Moyes, I have known you since you were a child. I adopted you as my nephew. You have risen step by step until you have become a general, one of the most important officers in my army and a governor of the province. Yet we hear reports from all sides that you are plotting to overthrow my regime. In recent revolts, many were shouting, Moyes forever! You have been tried for treason, inciting rebellion and imperiling the state, and now you have been found guilty. What have you to say? Why should I not sign this document? Sign or not, do as you please. It is a matter of perfect indifference to me what you do. I am not guilty of any treason. I have not plotted any rebellion. The court-martial knows that. You know it too. If people in a revolt shout my name, it is because they are against your regime. And no, I am against it too. You do not deny your guilt? What guilt? You speak like a public prosecutor. If to be against your policy is to be guilty of treason, then I am guilty, the most guilty man in San Domingo. But there are many thousands who think as I do. You are ready to overthrow the government of the country and place us at the mercy of our enemies. Your policy is placing us at the mercy of our enemies. I don't believe in maintaining the old estates and giving them back the old owners or the new generals. This one here. Pointing to Dessaline. He owns 30 plantations and he whips the laborers on the plantations as if they were slaves. That is not true. It is true. I've investigated it myself. I reported it to you. You've done nothing about it. General Dessaline, report to General Moyes what has been done about this matter. The Governor has informed me by letter and in person that if he hears of any single case in which a labourer was beaten on or any of my plantations, he would dismiss me from the services and, end and reduce me as ranks. Maybe you wrote to him and threatened him. But this brutality against the former slaves goes on all over San Domingo. I will have no part of it. I'll speak against it and act wherever I see it or hear it. The person responsible for it. General Overture is you. I've told you and I shall continue to say it. Court martial or no court martial. The country does not know where it stands. Is slavery abolished forever? What is the French expedition coming to restore slavery? The ex slaves don't know. The ex slave owners don't know. I've told you to declare the island independent. Expel all those who do not want to accept it. Assure the ex slaves that slavery has gone forever. That is what they want to know. Break up those accursed big plantations. As long as they remain, freedom is a mockery. Distribute the lands carefully among the best cultivators in the country. Let everybody see that there is a new regime. That is what I have said and that is what I will live or die by. Ten years ago, I took over the island. It was overrun with marauding soldiers and bandits. The Spanish government sent 50,000 soldiers, the British 60,000. We defeated them and drove them out. Production was almost ceased. Now it is two-thirds of what it was before, all within a year. Except for bandits in the hills, I have restored peace and order. All we need now is some help from France. <laughs> you are a dreamer. All you will get from Bonaparte is an army to restore slavery. Dessalines knows that. He's always saying that to the people. General, what about the papers? Keep him under arrest. I shall sign the order of execution later. Dessalines signals to Marat and Orléans. They seize Moyes and leave the room with him followed by Dessalines. March 24th, 1802, about six o'clock in the evening. The fortress of Crete a Piro in San Domingo. Placide, officer, Isaac, the clerk, De La Force, on a rampart, running diagonally across the stage, stands Toussaint. During the first part of the scene, he walks from one side to the other. At one end of the rampart is a flagstaff. 
in the courtyard of soldiers, cannon, etc. Enter Captain Verney, aide-de-camp to Toussaint. With writing materials in his hand, he climbs up to the ledge below Toussaint. Ready, General. How long will he wait? It is time for the retreat. He should have started at at least ten minutes. It is time, it is time. But didn't he begin to give way five minutes ago? Yes, he is giving way, but too slowly. Faster, faster. Give way faster and then run. I told him, run early. That will bring them on. Then stop and pretend to make a stand. Turn and run, turn and run. If he fights them too hard, they will not follow fast enough and all will be ruined. He turns around to Verney, but keeps looking through his glasses at short intervals. There are distant sounds of firing. A letter to uh, General Christophe, copy to De General Dessalines. Tell him that this is the 21st day of the siege. Tell him that we are reduced to 700 men. Tell him that we can make our food and water last three or four days, perhaps a week. Ah, they're giving way now, but still not fast enough. Does Antoine think I sent him there to enjoy himself? Uh, tell Christophe that in seven days we have beaten off three attacks. Sounds of musket shots. Ah, we are running at last. Tell him that we have begun to pound the fortress with heavy artillery. They are coming now. I cannot see Antoine. He is behind, sir. He should be in the front leading the retreat. Uh, tell Christophe that uh, the men suffer, but they will die rather than surrender. Tell him that every day the clerk sends messages to me promising everything <coughs> if only I will declare a truce and join him. I've told him that I shall hang the next messenger who comes. Tell him that we shall leave the fortress only when it falls to pieces around us. Give him, warnings, give him warm greetings to Christophe and to Dessalines. Tell Christophe I know he will hold Maroni as we shall hold Crete après -Hero. Exit Verney. Ah, here they come. How eagerly the fools follow. Not too fast, blacks. They may suspect. Antoine should stop and... Ah, he does it. Volley of shots. Toussaint puts down his glasses. Brave Antoine. Now run again. Trumpeter, sound the attention. The trumpeter sounds a call. Brave blacks, into the ditch, blacks, into the ditch. To the trumpeter. Sound the ready. In, in, in. Down, you stragglers, down. Sound the fire. The trumpeter sounds a call, and there is a roar of musketry from the fortress. Toussaint seizes a gun himself and fires. Hands the gun to the trumpeter to reload and fires another. <laughs> they scatter like flies. There is the continuous rattle of musketry from the fortress. Good shooting. Rake them down. Rake them down. <laughs> How they run. Trumpeter, sound the ceasefire and then the counter-attack. Run up the red flag, no quarter. The red flag goes up. He shouts below. The 3rd Regiment, by the northwest door. Ladders and planks for, the, for those in the ditch. Ladders and planks. Ladders and planks. There is great activity below. <laughs> how they run. Ah, if I had a division here, how many of you would get back home? Enter Verney. Verney. <laughs> they are in full retreat. 400 dead at least. Put it in the letter and be quick. It will be dark in half an hour. This is the time for the messenger to go. Enter Captain Antoine, followed by a bedraggled soldier. Ah, Antoine. To Trumpeter, handing him the glasses. Keep guard. He descends and embraces Antoine. Good work, Antoine. You should have started the retreat before, but all is well. How they fell into it. Who is this? He comes from Christophe with dispatches. Antoine hands them to Toussaint, who gives them to Verney, and Verney begins to read. General... Christophe still holds Mornay? Yes, General. Good. And he is well? Yes, General. Good. When did you get through the French lines? Last night, sir. I've been hiding all day, waiting for dark. Brave Negro. Give him food and water. <gasps> what is it, Verney? Read it. 19th March, 1802. To General Louverture, Commander-in-Chief. From General Christophe, greetings. For many weeks now, I have been receiving letters from General Leclerc, asking me to begin negotiations with him. Yes. After many requests and repeated pledges of good faith from him, I consented to have an interview with the Captain General. What? And I have agreed to enter his service 
as the last means of safeguarding our liberties. Give it to me. This is a tr then it is a trick, are you dog? He catches the messenger by his throat. The Frenchman bribed you. You said Mornay was safe. You said Christophe was well. He lets go of the messenger's throat, but holds the man and shakes him. Answer! The messenger cannot reply. Toussaint lets him go and falls to the ground. But it is a trick. Christophe is playing. To take him unawares and surprise him and massacre his, his soldiers. No, General. There are letters also from General Christophe's secretary. General Christophe is still at Mornay with all his soldiers, but there are French regiments there now, and he holds the town for General Leclerc. Go, all of you, leave me. Take this carcass away. Exit all except Toussaint, who mounts the ladder. Christophe gone, deceived by the Frenchman. Oh, God, that I had them both in my hands. They would never deceive again. Ah, Christophe, Christophe, to join the Frenchman. But it is not true. It cannot be true. It is a trick. The lying Frenchman tries to deceive. If Monet is gone and the armies are lost, all Negroes are slaves again. The guns begin to boom. Toussaint climbs to the top of the ledge and stands silhouetted against the night sky, dotted with stars. Ay, shoot, shoot. You have taken Monet, but you will not take Chet Pierrot. You will not take Lambé. You will not take Dondon. Gun sounds. Aye, shoot. We burnt Cap Francois. We shall burn Port-au-Prince. We shall destroy San Domingo. Make it a desert. Our bones will be your slaves. Yes, you deceived Christophe, but you will not deceive Dessalines. You will not deceive Montrepas. If Mornay is gone, then the armies are lost and the Negro slaves again. Enter Verney. Sir... We have questioned the messenger. Lombe, Dondon, all are gone. Our soldiers hold them, but they have all entered Leclerc's service. Mornay, Lombe, Dondon, all gone? All, sir. <coughs> then we are cut off. The whites will never leave us, never. Black skin, cursed by God, white God, black God. Same flesh, same blood, but black skin. Born to be slaves, all oh, my people. To sweat in the sun in the white man's field. To cook the white man's food. To groom the white man's horse. To clean the white man's shoes. They will never leave us, never. Oh, Christophe, Christophe. If Monet is gone, the armies are cut off and the Negroes slaves again. If we go on, we shall be destroyed. If we accept his terms, at least we shall have arms to defend our liberty. Surrender, and have others decide our fate. 1802, General Louverture's villa on the outskirts of Cap Francois. Placide, Officer, Isaac, Leclerc, Pauline, de la Force. General Leclerc. I have come to terms with you because to continue the war means only a further destruction of my country. I am, as you know, still powerful enough to burn, ravish, and lay waste, but it is my own country that I destroy, the country which we Negroes have fought so hard to set on its feet again. You have sworn a solemn oath to respect the liberties of my people. I swear it on the honor of a French officer. That was all I was fighting for. I withdraw. But if at any time those liberties are threatened, I hold myself free to break my oath. And I know that those brave and honest men whom you have taken into your service and who will serve you faithfully will never forget the watchword of every son of San Domingo, liberty or death. Tomorrow night I sleep in my own plantation at NRE, where I shall be if at any time you require me. And your son? He will have a bright future with us. I go with my father. I must leave now. Oh, surely, ge surely, General. You can stay with us for a while. It is impossible. My army is waiting, awaiting the signal for ratification. I am anxious for peace and to be relieved of the cares of state. He walks over to his soldiers. Let the, mess let the messengers go to Mornay at once. Take this. Gives a ring. Two soldiers leave. <laughs> soldiers! I address you for the last time. Slavery will not be restored in San Domingo. 
the general has sworn in the name of the supreme being to respect the liberties of our people. Every officer will be reemployed without loss of rank. For myself, I go into retirement of my own free will. Soldiers, it is now 10 years since we have been comrades on the battlefield. We have done many great things together. I must thank you for your courage, love, and devotion which you have always shown me. Now I have nothing more to give you. I leave with you the best of myself, our common memories. Nothing can take those from us. Toussaint descends the remaining steps to the courtyard <coughs> and stands looking at the men. An officer sheaths his sword and steps forward, taking off his hat, showing a grey head. Tears roll down his cheeks. General, is it over? He and Toussaint embrace. Toussaint embraces another officer. Tell the others what I have told you. Farewell. Toussaint salutes. The band strikes up to the attack grenadiers and the soldiers march off. Enter servants with wine. Isaac enters. General Liberteur, you will take some refreshment with us before you go. Thank you, madam. I will have a glass of water. They drink. The clerk and etc. go inside, leaving Delafosse, Toussaint, and his two sons outside. It is all settled, father. I hope so, Isaac. I am going to Henry. You will come and see us there, my son? Of course, father. How will you spend your retirement, general? Farming. I shall superintend the work in the fields, repair the buildings, cultivate the land, and improve the plantation. I shall have time now to entertain my friends, exchange visits, pay some attention to the domestic side of life, enjoy the company of my family. I have not had much time during the past, the last ten years. While he is speaking, French soldiers with fixed bayonets begin to appear in various parts of the courtyard and advance slowly towards him. Toussaint, unsuspecting, continues. I shall be happy to entertain you and your friends. He catches sight of the soldiers. He and Placide draw their swords. General, what is it? General Louverture, we are not making an attempt at your life, nor shall we do you any injustice or indignity. We merely have orders to safeguard your person. For what purpose? To send you to France. You are too dangerous to stay here. Father! You French traitors! Soldiers surround, uh, soldiers surround Toussaint, separating him from his two sons. Others seize Placide and Isaac. Your own black generals have told us that they cannot guarantee the peace of the country as long as you are in it. My own officers? Your own officers. How else could we dare to arrest you? They hope to save their properties and their rank. Fools! You can deceive them, General, but you cannot deceive those hundreds of thousands who have won their freedom. Do with me what you will. In destroying me, you destroy only the trunk, but the tree of Negro liberty will flourish again, for its roots are many and deep. Late 1802. Toussaint cell in a prison close to the Alps. Caffarelli. General Louverture, I bring you a message from the First Consul. General, before everything, I implore you, give me some news of my wife and sons. I have been here many months and have never heard a single word about them. I am sorry. I know nothing about your family, but I dare say I may be able to find something out later. I come on an errand of special importance. What is it? I am willing to answer all questions and I can prove my innocence. The First Consul has learnt from many sources that just before General Leclerc's arrival, you secreted 40 million francs in the Cajos Mountains in San Domingo. He wants you to tell, he wants you to tell me where that, rest, that treasure was hidden. Is that all? Tell me the hiding place, General, and I shall continue to do my utmost to help your cause with the First Consul. I hid no treasure. General, didn't you shoot the six Negroes who had carried the treasure into the mountains? It is a slanderous lie. What secret negotiations did you make with England about independence? I made none. General, this obstinacy will do you no good. The First Consul has charged me to get the information from you. If I go back without it, things will go bad with you. They could go no worse. This is too much. I have incurred the wrath of the First Consul, but as to my... 
As to fidelity and probity, I am strong in my conscience. Among all the servants of the state, none is more honest than myself. You were a traitor. Would a traitor have saved his country from, from his colony from Spain and Britain? I was one of his soldiers and the first servant of the Republic in San Domingo. I could have been king of a free island. Now I am ruined, dishonored, wretched, a victim in my, of my own services. As he speaks, Toussaint becomes gradually exhausted. He finally staggers to his feet, his chair, and crumbles into it, mumbling to himself. But I must take some sort of answer back to the First Consul. Going over, Toussaint shakes him. Pull yourself together, man, and speak. If you don't tell me where those Franks are, you will never see your wife and children again. And the First Consul will restore slavery in San Domingo. Toussaint slowly raises his head. Yes, the First Consul, consul will restore slavery in San Domingo. Do you hear? Slavery! Slavery in San Domingo? No. The First Consul can never restore slavery in San Domingo. No one will ever do that again. The army is defeated. Only a remnant remains. You can defeat an army, but you cannot defeat a people in arms. Do you think an army could drive those hundreds of thousands back into the fields? You have got rid of one leader, but there are 2,000 other leaders to be got rid of as well, and 2,000 more when those are killed. Whom do you think you are talking to? I shall put you in chains. I wouldn't wear them long. You have tried to break my spirit and use me against my own people. But the more you tortured me here, the more I was certain that you were failing there. There is little you can do to me now. His voice sinks. Slavery in San Domingo? Never. Never. He sinks back exhausted into his seat. They go off, the clock strikes three, the stage goes dark and gradually lightens again. Toussaint is still huddled in his chair. After a few moments, the clock strikes three again. At the first stroke, he holds up his head. By the third, he has risen to his feet. Oh! Desaline! Desaline! You were right. After all, he falls to the floor. May 1803, the large dining hall in the semi-official Hotel de la Republic, Cap Francois. There is news, General. News for all San Domingo. What? What is it? Toussaint is dead. There is a groan from the crowd. Dessalines and Christ Christophe look at each other. Did he die in prison? Bernie, unable to speak, nods his head. There is open lamentation. What else? This letter came by the boat this morning. <coughs> Read it. By this time, the crowd is pressing round in a solid mass, in dress and bearing there the civilized people. Reading. I have to tell you that General Louverture died a week ago in his prison at Fort de Joux. His jailers found him stiff in his cell where he had been dead, so it is reported, for three or four days. It is given out that he died from apoplexy, but the circumstances are very suspicious. The prison doctor has refused to sign the certificate. This is all I know at present. Meanwhile, accept my sincere sorrow and the sorrow of all our friends at the bitter fate of our great master. De Salines dashes the tears away from his eyes. See, Christophe, see what awaits us. There is also a postscript, General. Well, quick. Reading. Official information is difficult to get now since money no longer comes, but from reliable sources we learn that the First Consul intends to restore slavery immediately in Guadeloupe, Martinique, and Saint -Domin Domingo. Over my dead body. Over the body of every son of San Domingo. Desalines jumps onto the dining table, smashing and scattering crockery. The room is now filled with a throng of excited people. Friends, 
You have had two sons dead, who fought for our freedom. He made San Domingo our own country, the country of the blacks. Those whites said Negroes are stupid, fit for only be slaves, but Tucson ruled. In one year, he made San Domingo prosperous. Leclerc, he swore by the supreme being to respect the liberties of San Domingo. That made us join him. We wish to stop the strife, and now see what the treacherous dogs have done. See what they want to do. But we shall avenge Tucson. French blood in torrents shall flow. I, Desolai, swear Tucson died for liberty. We shall keep that liberty. Let their consul himself come. We shall keep it, or we shall die defending it. Liberty! Liberty, liberty or, or death. death! Liberty or liberty death! death. Liberty, liberty, or liberty or death! Liberty or death! The soldiers draw their swords. Suddenly there is a stir and pity and forces his way through. He approaches the table. What do you want here? Mulattoes are no friend of Negroes. The bastards they follow behind them like white dogs. I come as a friend. The first consul has ordered that the ancient regimes to be stored in San Domingo. The clerk told, told me, but he didn't say it was for mulattoes too. His army has already fallen to pieces, and I and my division will join you. Liberty of ours, if only we unite. Dessalim stretches out his hand and pulls Petian onto the table. He pulls Kristoff on the other side. To arms, friends, no rest, no sleep, till we drive every French man into the sea. From this minute, San Domingo is a free country. No, San Domingo no more. Haiti, the old name the island had before the Europeans came to bring slavery and degradation to Haiti. There is wild cheering. Haiti, no colony, but free and independent. Haiti for the first free and independent Negro state in the New World. Tucson died for it. He grips Petion and Christoph on either side. We shall live and fight for it. Bring me the flag. Bernie steps forward and hands him the flag on his sword. Dessalines is about to rip it vertically when he changes his mind. Instead, he rips the white off and throws it onto the table, pointing to the black. This is for the blacks. And this, pointing to the red, is for the Mulatto brothers, black and red. But this, pointing to the white, I trample under my feet. Frenzy cheering. Henceforth, this our flag. And now, friends, to the attack! Epilogue. The time is the present day. The scene is a private room in a hotel somewhere in an undeveloped country. The characters are dressed in ordinary <coughs> Western clothes rather than the native dress. They have no names, but the actors are easily recognised from the part they have played before. Speaker A, the actor who played Toussaint, and Speaker B, the actor who played Christophe, are sitting. There is another empty chair near them. Well, I think we have an hour or two to ourselves. The conference is over. The hotel is almost empty. As chairman, I felt all through. I, I knew that the speakers were really speaking to their public at home scoring points against the opposition, seeking to impress the British government or the American government. <laughs> In fact, doing everything except concentrating on the real business of the conference. Now, before we go our separate ways, here we can talk free and at least know what we really think. Once again, our links with each other are split. We are now severely limited as to the numbers who can emigrate our economic situation is as bad as it can be. Where, where do we go from here? I'm really pleased that we're having this informal talk in which we can get to know exactly where we stand. We are split up, it is true, but I still believe we are one people, and I still believe that we must look forward to a new unity, perhaps in a hundred years. I and my party always put that in the forefront of our propaganda, and particularly when I'm abroad. We must be progressive, but at the same time realistic. Of course, we are not communists. 
But one must take a world view. For instance, you can't blame the Viet Cong for being communist. We've been saved from communism by geography, but we are, to a substantial degree, socialist. Our program lays heavy emphasis on social security, and that is socialism. At the same time, we are for the individual to make the best of his talents, not only for the community, but for himself. That is capitalistic, free enterprise. I am a practical politician, and practical politics demands that you learn to be on both sides of a question, any serious question, at the same time. But I want to be clear. Will your party advocate alignment with the democracies or non-alignment, or what? We are non-aligned. But it is a special kind of non-alignment. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever a serious question is up, we are with the democracies. The democratic leaders know that. We take care that we know that. But whenever the situation is not important, we let everyone know that we are non-aligned. <laughs> Enter Speaker C with great decisiveness. Ah, there you are. We have been uh, clarifying positions. Now that we are broken up, our friend here has been dealing with the specific policies of his party. I know what my party wants to do. I want to fight somebody, lead the masses in, in the struggle. The masses? You think we ought to begin a serious struggle against the foreign companies, our capitalist oppressors? No. No one is going to call me a communist. Then you are definitely for the preservation of the, of the system under which we live, the capitalist system. Me? Preserve that system? No, no, sir. You want to ruin me politically? But we are not in council. The press is in here. We are trying to find out what we as the leaders think on fundamentals. Generally speaking, one is either for capitalism or for socialism. <laughs> Don't pin any of those filthy labels on me. We for independence and we want it without being labelled by any ism. I don't meddle with those things. I am a union leader as well as a prime minister of my country. Not only do I not subscribe to any isms, I do not even tolerate any of them being preached at home. We just plain old fashioned democracy. One man, one vote. I am no doctor of philosophy as it is. Nevertheless, your refusal to take any clear position is quite consistent with his. But I don't think we need go to go on for the time being, particularly because some of our trade unions are holding a conference. The chairman of the conference is to broadcast. I have arranged so that we can hear. Before an answer can be made, a servant, obviously by prearrangement, he should be recognizable, comes into the room and fiddles with an imposing radio hitherto unnoticed. A servant or two begin to appear. Lights go on in the small room on the left, and a speaker is seen speaking to an audience off stage. He has an aide by his side. His back is to the people in the hotel room. He is three quarters turned away from the audience. His voice comes over the microphone. And now, fellow workers, comrades and friends, I must come to a conclusion. It is not my business to tell you what we have to do. If over these hundreds of years we do not know what to do, what we have to do, we will never know. There is a burst of applause on the radio and a murmur of approval amongst the employees and others who have crowded in. What I have to tell you, and particularly the youth among you, is that you will have to fight. Make up your minds. The great democratic principles that we have inherited were won by people fighting for their rights. They can be extended and in fact can only be preserved by you. Another burst of applause. Independence. What is independence? How can you be independent if the very ground on which you walk belongs to the people in London, New York and Paris? The land is ours, we must get it back. There is a burst of applause on the radio and a murmur of approval amongst the employees and others who have crowded in. <coughs> we must get it back. We can use the system of parliamentary democracy, or parliamentary democracy or no parliamentary democracy. We must get the land back. Another burst of applause. <coughs> we have a national flag. We have a national anthem. We have a parliament and a prime minister. 
but until we get the land, all that says nothing. If you haven't got the land, then the anthem, the flag, the parliament, and the prime minister serve the people who have the land. Applause. Once it is ours, we must make it ours again. Tremendous applause cuts off the speaker. He stands, unable to go on. The employees and others start to applaud. The waves of applause on the radio continues. Wiping his face with a handkerchief, the speaker half turns to the people in the room. It is now seen that he wears a black patch over his right eye. At the sight of him, one by one the political leaders stand and each in his own way joins in the applause. The radio plays a song of Samadhi Smith orchestrated. <laughs> want to say that uh, Paul Robeson, and I tried to do this in the play, um, uh, was a big fan of Toussaint Louverture, obviously, and uh, I'm speaking to people who know, but maybe you guys don't know. Um, CLR James had this idea of writing this history of the, the rebellion, and he came to a stage where he thought, if this is to happen, it will probably be... It, probably will not happen unless we get the great Paul Robeson to play it. And, and that is eventually what happened. Paul Robeson made a window in his schedule and it, and it happened. Uh, but I try to portray in the play how Paul Robeson always paid homage to Toussaint Louverture and all the people that went before him. So, um, uh, so at the very end of my play, where I have portrayed his life, Paul Robeson's life, his, his activism, his breakdown, his battle with the House and American Activities Committee, his mental illness after he, his loss of his passport and all that, you know, a career lasting about 50 years of real activism. And then uh, he's already gets towards the end, he's getting quite old. And he says, uh, about a year or so after I got back to America, I was approached by this young Negro reporter in Harlem. He was canvassing the opinion of uh, the Negro on the street about the Montgomery bus boycotts, and he asked me what I thought. Well, I said that I fully supported uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and his people, and that their action was proof that the Negro would not rest until he attained full equality and dignity. I said they were only carrying on a great tradition of people who went before, like Frederick Douglass, Ida Wells, Toussaint Louverture, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, and so many others. Well, King was shot dead too. Buried on my 70th birthday, as it happens, and he was only 39. And then the CIA, they helped kill Patrice Lumumba in the Congo. And you watch, Walter Sisulu and uh, uh, Nelson Mandela, they'll probably die in jail too. Now that young reporter, he asked me who he could quote. Paul Robeson, I said. Paul Robeson. No, 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 no. <laughs> R-O-B-E-S-O-N. He thanks me, shakes my hand, and then walks right on to the next person. Seems I've been assassinated too. <laughs> Not sure when exactly. Thank you. Uh -huh.